I know what I need. I need more money, more time, more motivation, more energy, more things to fill me, to make me happy, to make me whole. But it's not enough. I'm still empty. Okay, well, maybe I need more friends or more freedom, more stability, more confidence. No, that's not it either. I'm missing something. Something more. I need more. More than anything I could ever think or imagine, I need more. Because everything I try doesn't seem to measure up. I need more. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. How many of you enjoying this amazing weather that we're having here in Kansas City? Wow, who would have thought it would be January? It's fantastic. Glad you're here. If you're watching us online, thanks for uh, being with us as well. Um, how many of you are here? I, I ask this question every Sunday. How many of you are here because you want to have God speak to you? Do you believe that God speaks? You're that kind of church that believes that God actually speaks to us? Keep your hands up because I want to pray for you. We're that kind of church. Uh, as a symbol of just raising your hand, that means, God, you want, you want him to speak to you. You're saying, God, speak to me. So let's keep our hands up. Father, I thank you that you still speak today, that you long to communicate with us, that you want to whisper words of wisdom and insight and direction. And today, Father, I pray for those that have their hands up, Lord, that their hearts are open and receptive to hear what you have to speak to them today. Not my words, but the words of the Holy Spirit, God. I pray that they would reverberate loud and clear in our hearts. In Jesus' name, and everybody that wanted that said, amen. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, God has something amazing for you today. Okay. Woo, I like it. We're awake today. That's good. I didn't have to tell you to do it twice. All right, you guys ready? Okay, so get, get on the edge of your seat. Posture, I got some powerful news I want to share with you today. You ready? Okay, here we go. The four sons of Issachar were Tola and Pua and Jashub and Shimron. Now, the sons of Tola were Uzi and Rephiah and Jeriel, Jemiah, Ibsam, and Shemuel, you track with me so far? Three of Benjamin's sons were Bella, Becker, Jedile. Now, there were five sons of Bella, were Esbon, Uzi, Uziel, Jeremathoth, and Ir. You guys tracking with me so far? <laughs> hey, this is good stuff. Not every preacher will go through these names. You want me to keep going? Because there's a whole lot of them. I read it this week. So if you're not a, if you're not a church person, we're glad you're here today. Um, and maybe you're churched and you've never heard of these names before. I read them um, this week going through a book in the Old Testament called Chronicles. First Chronicles. And there are literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of names. And I'm reading through it. And I'm thinking to myself, man, I've never heard of Jeremoth. I've never heard, anybody heard of Jedile? Know who Jedile is? How about Zethan? No? Okay, Aher? Anybody? Aher? Okay, oh, oh, one person. Okay, that's good. I find it fascinating. As I was reading through uh, First Chronicles this week, Reading through lists and lists and lists of names, it struck me this time as I read it, and I forced myself to kind of read through all the names, because a lot of us, we just try to gloss over it. But as I was thinking about it, it struck me that God knew every single one of them by name. 
He doesn't just know them by name. He has those who are composing the Old Testament, that the Holy Spirit is moving through them, that they compose this genealogical record that every single person in this genealogical record is important to God. That ev- They're not just numbers. Every number has a name. And every name has a story, and every story matters to God. Did you know that? Let me say that again. Every number has a name, every name has a story, and every story matters to God. Did you know that you have a story that matters to God? That, that your story matters. You might be like Jehael. No one has ever heard of you, but God knows who you are. You, you might be some indiscriminate name like Ahur or Hushim, or it could be the descendants of Aramean or Azrael or Makir or whoever it might be, but God knows who you are and your story matters to him. Did you know that? Your story is significant. And I think sometimes we neglect to understand the importance of what God wants to do in us and through us. I want you to know today that God has more for your story today. You may just think, well, I'm just so-and-so. I'm just John. I'm just Amy. I'm just Cynthia. I'm just, you know, fill in the blank with your name. I'm just, you know, Ethan. I, but you're important. You matter. If you're here today and, and you're not really churched, I want you to know if you're visiting today, your story matters. Your name, who you are, you matter to God. I want you to know that God has great plans and purposes for your life. He's got a great purpose for your life, that you matter to him. And sometimes it's easy for us to come to church and sit down and think, well, I'm not a pastor, I'm not a communicator, I'm not a leader, I'm not really that important, I'm just kind of a nobody. But I want you to know that you're a somebody in God's eyes, that that you're significant to him. And he had... Two whole book, first and second chronicle, half of second chronicles is, is just a list of people's names because he wants you to know that, that you matter. Every one of you has a story. I want you to know that this morning. That God formed and fashioned you intimately in your mother's womb. That he knit you and put you together. That it wasn't just a haphazard type of thing. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't an oops. There are no oopses here in this church. There's no oopses in the world. God destined you to be born, and he has a destiny for you because you matter. Don't let anyone say, well, you're just, you know, part of the crowd, and you don't really matter, and you're just a no one and a no name and a no town and a wherever in the middle of Shawnee and no one cares. No, you matter to God. You matter so much. I want to make this clear today that Jesus Christ himself came from heaven above on a rescue mission to save you because he wants your story to be put on the right path. Because we were headed down a wrong path. Our trajectory was wrong. We were selfish and full of sin and doing our own thing, going our own way. And Jesus came and he rescued us and he died on the cross. And that's why we did communion this morning is to remember the sacrifice that Jesus did for you. Not just, not yeah, he died for the world, but he died for you. And you matter. A theologian said, if there was just you on this planet, God would have come just for you. That's how much he loves you. He didn't just die for the whole world, he died for you. And we have to understand this. So, you see, if you have this foundation that understands that I matter, that my story matters to God, then then. It's not just your story that matters, but what you do in that story matters as well. If Jesus went to the cross just for you, and if you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, I want to give you that opportunity today where you trade your sin, your junk, your failures, your mistakes, your shortcomings, all the good that you've ever done. You exchange that for Jesus, and he gives you his life. 
full of goodness and mercy and compassion and grace. And then he says that he'll never leave you or forsake you. He's going to give you power and authority to overcome the wickedness and evil in your life. It's not that you're going to become perfect right now, but God's going to head you on the path of trajectory to perfection because we move, Scripture says, from glory to glory. And eventually, we're going to have resurrected bodies and we're going to spend eternity with God in heaven. We're going to know him even as he knows us right now. That's the power of the story that you have, that you're living right now. And so what you do now in your story really matters. You might think it's not that big of a deal, but what you do now, it shapes eternity forever and ever. And so if you've never given your life to Christ, I want you to know that he bled and died just for you so that he could have a relationship with you, so that he could talk with you and be with you and commune with you because he loves you so much. Man, I want you to know that. God loves you. Right now, he loves you. There's coming a judgment day. I don't know if you know that or not. But at the end of your life, After you've taken your final breath, every single one of us, when we take our final breath, we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and he's going to judge us based on what we did and didn't do. And if we didn't uphold the law absolutely perfectly, if we didn't do everything right, if we we missed just one little error, then we are destined for eternal separation from God. That's just the way it works. God's perfect. God is perfect and holy, and he cannot surround himself with anything less than perfection but the good news is that's where jesus comes in that's where jesus comes in because none of us are perfect i don't care the most the most righteous perfect person in here doesn't measure up and that's why our story really is insignificant it's meaningless without jesus Once we receive Jesus and what he did, his blood covers us, and then it enables us then to live forever with God in heaven. And I wanted to make sure we understood that this morning. And there may be some of you that maybe you heard that for the first time at the end of the service. I'm going to give you an opportunity to raise your hand, and you're going to receive Christ in your life, and he's going to come. And it's because of that, your faith and trust in him, not in yourself, that then will allow you to live forever with God in heaven. But I think for most of us that are believers, we have challenges because we think our story doesn't really matter a whole lot. And what tends to happen is that we get, what I say, stuck in our story. We get stuck. There was this um, guy in the New Testament who was a young kid. His name was was, uh, John. He actually had two names. One was a Greek and one was a Hebrew name. But we'll go with his his Hebrew name right now, John. John had... uh, This incredible opportunity. I mean, an amazing opportunity. He was just getting started in life. He came from a pretty wealthy background. He, he, uh, his, his mom was was uh, well. She had her own house, and people would gather there, and they'd have prayer meetings, and and it was a pretty pretty influential family in Jerusalem at the time. And we know that they were pretty well off. We we believe that maybe his father had passed away when he was young, and. And uh, so he had everything going for him. And he had this amazing cousin. His cousin's name was Barnabas. And Barnabas was this uh, incredible communicator. He communicated God's truth so much so that when people heard him talk, that they began to give their lives to Jesus Christ, that God would do incredible, miraculous things through his cousin, Barnabas. Barnabas connected with another man by the name of Paul, and together they became a powerhouse of missionaries, and they decided that they wanted to go and travel all the way up into Asia. You see, they were in the Middle East, and they they believed that God was calling them to some regions beyond just the area of Jerusalem, that they were taking the gospel seriously, that God wanted them to move out from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. And so they got on a boat and a ship, and they wanted to hire an assistant, and so they hired John. John Mark was his name. And so they hired him and, and put him on as their personal assistant. And there were several others that were with him. And, and they began to, to begin to travel from one area to another. And John Mark's responsibility was to make sure that all the itinerary was set right, that they had all the food and all the money and all the finances and everything was coordinated just so. Of course, John Mark is 
having his dream job. He's living out the dream of his life. His story is headed in the right direction. He comes from the right family. He's got the right finances. He's got the influence and, and the right connections. And he gets on this ship headed towards Asia. And he heads to an island first. At, well, it's Barnabas' hometown. It's in Cyprus. And so they get off and they, they begin to talk about Jesus. And something incredible happens on this island. On this island, there was a governor. And the governor was highly influential, of course, over the whole community. But there was also this sorcerer that was there as well. And this sorcerer was very concerned about Barnabas and Paul. Because Barnabas and Paul were talking about the goodness and the grace of Jesus Christ. And this sorcerer wanted to keep this governor in his hip pocket. He was trying to influence and manipulate him. And, and as a result of influencing and manipulating him, he knew that if he had turned toward Jesus Christ, he was going to lose his influence. And Paul has an encounter with this sorcerer and he says, you're the one that is keeping Jesus Christ from being known in this community. You are an evil, wicked person and for a time God is going to blind you. And immediately there's this mist of darkness that covers this sorcerer. And he begins groping about not knowing where he's going and what he's doing and asks other people to help him. And immediately the fear of God moves upon this whole island so much so that the governor himself becomes a believer in Jesus Christ. And hundreds and hundreds of people come to know Christ. Well, John Mark is there. Can you imagine being in the middle of that crowd? Hearing this, seeing this with your own eyes, seeing the power of God. But something happens in John Mark's life. Something happens to him. And as they conclude their ministry on this island where Barnabas' friends are and begin then to go across the strait into Asia, into darker, deeper territory, Mark gets stuck. And instead of traveling with his cousin and with Paul and with all the others, Mark does something that I think a lot of us do. He got scared. He got just a little bit overwhelmed. And instead of heading to Asia, he gets on another ship and he heads back to Jerusalem. And he deserts the team. John Mark got stuck. He had a setback in his story. Have you ever had a setback in your story? Have you ever had one of those moments when you were headed one way, everything was going really well, and then something happened in your life that caused you to trip? Something happened in your life that, that, that created some kind of da dynamic where, where there was some fear, there was some worry, maybe it was a relational conflict, maybe it was a spouse, maybe it was somebody that hindered you or kept you from really doing what you knew God wanted you to do, and instead of pursuing it, you turned around the other way. You were like Jonah. God called you to go one way and instead of going the direction that God called you to do, you, you headed the other way. Instead of heading for Asia, you, you turned for Jerusalem. I think there's a lot of people that get stuck in their story. You see, God doesn't want you to get stuck in your story. He doesn't want you to have setbacks in your story. He wants you to move forward. God has much more for you. Did you know that? God has more for you. I think one of the reasons why Mark got stuck is because he was worried about what was going to take place. You see, he come from a pretty wealthy family. I, the theologians aren't quite sure exactly why he turned around, but we do know that Paul was pretty upset, that Paul was angry and frustrated because he deserted the team. He, he left his post. He wasn't doing what he was supposed to do. And so as a result of that, he hightailed it, headed from Asia and, and went back to Jerusalem. He went back to mom is what happened. He went back to, he was a mama's boy. He went back to mom. He went back where the comfort was, where the money was, where the food was better, where his bed was comfortable, where things were nice and easy, where things were comfortable. How many of you like comfort? How many of you like to be in your own bed? How many of you like to eat your own food? You like things just a certain way, right? C.S. Lewis has this interesting quote. And he says this about comfort. He says, comfort is the one thing you can't get by looking for it. I want to tear this apart just for a second. Comfort is the one thing you can't get by looking for it. He, sa he says this, and I want, I want to read this because I think it's pretty profound. Again, C.S. Lewis sometimes can be a little bit challenging to read, but 
uh, I think he makes an incredible point that, that I want to read. And, and, he, and he says something like this. He says, if you look for truth, you may find comfort. But if you look for comfort, you won't get comfort or truth. You'll have wishful thinking and then end up in despair. Okay, let me say that again because I know, I know it's, it's long here. If you look for truth, you may find comfort. But if you just look for comfort, you won't get comfort or truth. You'll have wishful thinking and then end up in despair. You see, what a lot of people think here in the United States in the 21st century is if I can just get comfortable, if I can just have a life of ease, if all my bills were paid and my house was paid off and I didn't have any debt and I was unsaddled with all the burdens and the worries and the concerns of life, if I just had a life of comfort, if I could just get comfortable, then life would be good. And let me tell you something, that's a, a deception from the enemy. You see, the American dream is to pursue comfort, but that's not the dream that God has for you. You see, when you begin to, to search for comfort, when you begin to have your life's goal is to have all of these things checked off, I want the house paid off, and I want to be out of debt, and I want to have a nice house, and I want to have a nice life, and nice kids, and all of those kind of things, you're setting yourself towards the wrong trajectory of what God wants for you. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, he doesn't call you to seek after comfort. Ooh, now I'm meddling. Ooh, watch out. What is the preacher saying? I want to say, if you're a Christian, okay, I, I'm, I'm sorry, to, it, God doesn't want you to seek after comfort. That's not your main goal in life. Listen, there are a lot of wealthy people out there that are not happy. They have a lot of comfortable things, but they, they, they haven't really found the thing that, that really makes them satisfied in life. There's a lot of famous people out there that have everything and people want to give them everything and they have a life of ease and everything that they could ever want and hope for. But how many of you know a lot of, a lot of famous people, are, their lives are wrecks? We see it on the front page of the newspaper and the magazines every single day and online. We, we see that. How many of you know lottery winners? Just because you get a million dollars or five million dollars or a hundred million dollars, it doesn't solve all the problems that you have in your life. If you make money the goal of your life, I promise you're going to be frustrated. If you, met, if you make the, the goal of trying to get rid of all your debt in your life, if, that, if that's your goal, if that's what you want to, you're never going to really understand what true satisfaction is. Jesus was radical, and this is what he said. He said, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Can you tell your neighbor, give up your own way? Can you say that today? Give up your own way. Oh, I'm not hearing as much right now. Let's say that one more time to your other neighbor. Tell them they need to hear it. Ooh, these are hard truths. Sorry. That's what I'm preaching today. If any, this is Jesus. Lovable, wonderful, comfortable Jesus. Jesus that makes us feel good. And that's what a lot of us want to hear, right? Jesus just wants to make me happy and blessed. No, Jesus says, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. He's not necessary. I want to make this clear because it's not about money. God's not saying that you have to give up your wealth. Okay, this, that's not what he's saying. He's not saying give up your comfort. He's not saying give up your comfortable bed and your house and all that kind of stuff. That's not what he's saying. But what he is saying, which is so much more deeper than just money or comfort, he says, you must give up your own way. If you want to be my disciple. And you got to take up your cross. In other words, when your way and God, God's way intersects, Jesus says, my disciples will take God's way every time. If God calls you to give away X amount of finances, your way and his way may come in an intersection. And what are you going to do? If God says to give away your house or your clothes or, or if he says, I want you to do this or go here or be this or do that. See, that's the intersection of real discipleship right there. What are you going to do? And Jesus says, my disciples, the ones who follow me, they take up their cross every single day. It's not just a one-time decision where we raise our hand and say, God, I love you. You're the, you're the Lord of my life. And then I do whatever I want after that and pray for God to bless me. That's not how it works. You see, when you give up your own way and you pursue God's way, God's story for your life will begin again. You see, when, when, when we begin to do our way, our story stops. 
When we begin to go our own direction and our own path and our own plan, when we do that, our story comes to a grinding halt. But when we enter into God's story that he wants to work through us, when his intersection and my intersection come to a fore, then, then I can say, God, I want your kingdom to come and your will to be done, not my will. I want your will to be done. And God, sometimes I fall and make mistakes, but God, at the end of the day, I want you. That's when he can really start to have my story matter. So don't get stuck. That's what happened with John Mark. He got stuck. He, he wanted his, I'm conjecturing a little bit. We don't know exactly why he left, but I'm going to say from the, and the evidence, it seems like he wanted Jerusalem. He wanted something. So he got stuck. Don't get stuck in your story. Pursue God's way. That, so these are the, the three things that I have for you real quick. I spent the most time on the first thing. Don't get stuck in your story. That, that's the one that derails us from God's story. And the way to counterbalance that is to chase God's way, to pursue his way in our lives. The, the, the second thing is that, well, I, I want to share this up. When I was first married, and I was introduced to my wife's family, and I was finally invited to go to the Thanksgiving meal. Anybody remember the first time you were at your in-law's place? And they began to have their meal, and as they began to talk and share, and of course I'm, you know, trying to meet everybody and connect all the dots, and, and I was hearing all the stories. I was hearing the stories from my wife's family. And one of the stories that I'm going to share with you today is something very simple, but they thought it was really funny. And, and so they would, they would say this. They say, David, you, you, don't, you don't know this, but several years ago, we were headed to their, they were headed to their, uh, Heather's grandmother's house, my wife's grandparents' house, and, and, well, they forgot the cranberries. Anybody ever forget the cranberries? And so they had this joke, and it was really kind of dumb, but they thought it was really funny. And they would all together at the, I'm not kidding you, all of them together at the Thanksgiving table, they said, we forgot the cranberries. And I'm looking at them going, what did I just marry into? <laughs> that is not funny. <laughs> but they would laugh and hackle, and they just thought it was funny. <laughs> They forgot the cranberries, and Grandma thought it was funny, and they thought it was funny, the kids thought it was funny, and I'm like, okay, whatever. <laughs> so then the next Thanksgiving happens. We're gathered around the Thanksgiving table. Now I know who everybody is because, of course, I had Christmas and Fourth of July and birthdays, and I knew everybody. Gather around the Thanksgiving tables, and, and what, what happens? We forgot the cranberries. <laughs> and I'm looking around going, you've got to be kidding me. I kid you not, third year, gathered around the Thanksgiving table, what do they say? We forgot the cranberries. You know anyone like that? It shares the same story over and over and over. It wasn't even that funny in the first place. You guys know those, you know what they're called? They're called repeat talkers. You know repeat talkers? They say they share the same story over and over and over and over. And you're like, yeah, I know, I can tell the story better than you can. I wasn't even there. You know what I'm talking about? repeat story those people drive me crazy because i'm one of them i share the same stories over and over but they're my stories and i like them right you have your stories that you like to share well i think it's kind of like that in our own christian faith the thing that will derail us from the story that god has for us is that we tend to tell the same story over and over and over when god has more for us I remember back in 1972, that's when God's spirit fell, and it was so powerful. I re and it was powerful. See, it was powerful. Now, I want to be careful, because just like my wife's family, I don't want to make them feel bad about their story. Right? I'm not disparaging the story. But if all we have as Christians is, well, do you remember back 35 years ago when we were at 42nd Street and Bruce Rowe was playing on the piano? Man, those were the good old days. Man, if we could just get back there, life would be great. And, and I'm talking to some of you. I'm going to make you uncomfortable right now. If all you have is old stories and something's wrong with you, because God wants more than the old stories. He wants to do something new in you. 
And if all you are is comfortable with what we used to do back 20 years ago and 30 years ago and 40 years ago, then you're missing on the new things that God wants to do for you now. See, if you want to engage in the story that God has for you, it didn't just happen 10 chapters ago. It's happening in the pages of your life right now. Right? I I want you to say this to your neighbor, and this is very intentional today. I want you to say, forget all that. Oh, now meddling again. I know, pastor's meddling. Forget all that. Say that one more time. Forget all that. Okay, listen. I got some scriptural proof. I do. I've got some scriptural proof. And it's pretty powerful, too. I was reading it this week, and I was like, whoa, that's good. I was aiming it myself when I was reading this. Look, Isaiah 43, and I, I hadn't quite caught the context of this before until this week when I read this. This is, this is what God says. I am the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's creator and king. I am the Lord who opened a way through the waters, making dry path through the sea. He's talking about Moses. He's talking about the children of Israel going through on dry land. It was powerful and potent. He says, I called forth the mighty army of Egypt with all its chariots and all its horses, and I drew them beneath the waves, and they drowned. Their lives were snuffed out like a smoldering candle wick. Verse 18, but forget all that. This is God about what he did. Forget all that. It is nothing compared to what I'm going to do. Can I get an amen? Listen, forget all that. It's nothing compared to what I'm going to do. If your greatest story is behind you, you might as well give up now. You might as well just toss in the towel. I believe God's got greater things for you, not worse things for you. That he wants to do more important things, new things, greater things, better things for you in the chapters to come. But if you keep looking back, if you keep looking back, if you keep looking back, you're going to be turned into a pillar of salt. God can't use you. You're going to be frozen. You're going to be stuck. You're going to be dried up. You're going to be useless. God wants you to have your eyes on the future because he's doing a new thing. Now, I want to balance this, but Pastor David, I got saved in 1974. Well, that's great. There are mile markers in our lives that we want to hold true and hold fast, and we want to tell those stories. But if that's the only story that you have, then I want to challenge you today. God's got something more for you. Does that make sense? We can have the remembrance of those things. God did too. But he was specific here with Isaiah. Listen, forget all that. I want to do something new for you. Which leads me to a really important point today. And that is, and they're going to he's going to play a little bit. But I, I want to make sure that we understand that as believers in Jesus, God has something so much more for you. We're going to be doing a, a new series of small groups entitled uh, More, a study of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And some of you, you have no stories of the power of the Holy Spirit moving through you. You don't have any new stories. You you remember back to the 70s or to the 80s or maybe some of you to the 90s. And I'm telling you, God wants to move in you in a new way. And I believe that this small group series, More, a study of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, will enable you to have new stories, fresh stories of God moving through you. He wants you to stir up the gifts within you and begin to set out into new territory, into new waters, because I believe God wants to prophesy through you. He wants you to speak in tongues. He wants you to have word of wisdom and knowledge and understanding. And some of you have no idea what I'm talking about, but I want you to understand. I want you to get in this class and you're going to learn about it. We make it super easy and simple and God's going to move through you in a powerful way. But you can't be used by God's story if all you do is just sit there and remember the past and sit in your seat and go, yep, I remember those days. Those were great. I just can't wait for them to come to me now. Just come to me now. No, God wants you to get up out of that seat. He wants you to go back there. He wants you to sign up for a small group. He wants you to actively engage in the ministry that God has for you because he's got more for you. He's got more for you. And he's got more for you. I want this whole church. Listen, we've got a mission to reach this community for Jesus Christ. And we can't do that if we're limp and we're lame and we're powerless. And I want to, I just want to, I just want to push you just a little bit 
today and say, stop being so comfortable, stop being so apathetic, stop looking to the past and start looking to the future. Now listen, I, I, I got permission. I, I talked to someone today right here in our congregation. She's 80 years old. God spoke to her this week. She's been reading Bible and scripture. She says, God's got a mission for me. I'm 80 years old. He's still got a mission for me. I want to be 80 and still have a mission. You want to be 80 and still have a mission? You want to have, and be 80 and have God still speaking to you? That's what this lady, she's saying, you know what God told me? He says, you're going to be a bridge. I'm going to be a bridge. She's like, bridge? What do you mean? She says, yeah. She said, I worked with high school students when I was young, and now I'm working with older people right now in my Sunday school class, but I'm calling to be a bridge. I want to encourage. I want to pray for. I want to minister to. You see, that is the trajectory of the story that God has for us. And Paul, he put it this way. He said, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. I forget the past. I look forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Jesus Christ is calling us. Man, I pray that that would be on every single one of your hearts. That you wouldn't give up, that you wouldn't have your setback, but you would have a great comeback. That God would allow you to do the thing that he's called you to do. But you have to get up. You gotta move. You gotta take some steps. Don't keep repeating stories. Don't get, don't go back to Jerusalem. Don't get stuck. Do the thing that God's called you to do. All right, I'm rambling on now, but I want you to go back I want you to sign up for a small group. If you're not in a small group, I want you, I'm asking you as your pastor, get in a small group. We're going to study the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You don't have to be worried about it. You don't have to be fearful. Uh, we keep it very, very kind of elementary. We want every single one of you to take steps into having the Holy Spirit move through you. And I promise you, if you do it, that you'll be used by God in ways that you, you, you couldn't even imagine right now. So that's my challenge for you today. Don't get stuck. Don't keep saying the same story. God's got a great comeback for you. Amen. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads with me this morning? Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Help us not be stuck. Help us not be in status quo. Help us not just live comfortable lives. Lord, I pray that you would motivate your people. Today, God, would you speak to them, not, not just because I'm pushing them, but God, I pray your Holy Spirit would push us to do what you called us to do, that we would recognize that you have more for our story. We keep our eyes closed and our head bowed. There may be some of you here this morning, you've, you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. I want to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus. You exchange your life for his, your sins for his perfection, your mistakes for his goodness. And that's you right now. I just simply want you to raise your hand because God wants to come into your life. I'm not going to embarrass you, but you're going to pray and ask Jesus Christ to come to your life. If that's you and you say, yeah, I want Jesus, just lift up your hand right now. I want to pray for you right where you are. Anyone that would say, yeah, that's me. Just wave it around. Let me know. That's you. Yeah, I see that one hand. Anybody else that would say, yeah, I see those hands over there. Anybody else that would say, yeah, that's me. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic have two or three of you that raised your hand. We're going to pray together. Whole church is going to pray. I want you to know, God wants to come in and change your story today. We're going to all pray together. Just repeat after me. Make this your prayer, and God's going to come into your life. Let's pray together. Jesus, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. I believe you died on the cross. I turn from my sin, and I'm going to follow you all the days of my life. I believe you died on the cross, that you rose again, that you give me new life. Come into my heart. I trust in you. I believe in you. I'm going to walk with you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's give these a great big hand that prayed that prayer. Let's give them a great big hand. Welcome them into the family of God. Let's go ahead and stand this morning. If you prayed that prayer, I would love to pray with you and give you some next steps. Meet me right here up front after the service. I'd be glad to chat with you. Maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you, you wanted to receive Christ. I'll pray with you right here and give you some next steps. Everybody else to my left and your right, we have some prayer banners over here. We'd love to pray with you this morning. Believe that God wants to do more in your story.
Well, everyone, lift up your hands as a way of receiving God's blessing in your life. Father, I pray that you would bless your people, that you would give them more in their story, that they wouldn't be satisfied with status quo, that they wouldn't be apathetic, but God, that you would do more in them and through them in 2018. God, I pray that many of them would go back and sign up and be used of you in powerful ways. In Jesus' name, and everybody that agreed with that said amen. Amen. Have a great Sunday.